Hey, today's topic is how we create synthetic videos using artificial intelligence. And if you want, this is almost like creating deep fake videos for businesses. And I have had my own experience with this. I've created my own avatar, I've published my first videos. And to discuss this in a bit more detail, I am joined by Victor Rup Rupabelli, who is the CEO and co-founder of Synthesia. Hi, Victor. Hi, Bernard. Thanks for inviting me. It's so nice to have you with us. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background before we kick off. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for having me on the show. It's super, super exciting to be here. So, uh, so I'm Victor. I'm Danish originally. I live in London today. And uh, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Synthesia, which is the world's largest platform for AI video generation, where we allow people to create video content without cameras, actors, studios, and uh, time-consuming uh, post-production. My own background is um, I started kind of building websites, e-commerce stores in my late teens, uh, graduated from there to work in the Danish kind of startup ecosystem, was a part of uh, some companies that went really well and still exist today, and some companies that didn't go so well, but I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially kind of my my interests and and what I would say that I'm, I'm really good at is like product, um, and trying to build for the future, right? That's what I'm. That's what really excites me. So five years ago, I decided to start Synthesia with uh, my three other co-founders. So um, there's two professors involved in the company. Professor Matthias Niesner, he's one of the leaders in the space of uh, of, of deep fakes, a synthetic video, or neural rendering, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he used to be at Stanford. He's now in in Munich in Germany. And Professor Ludwig Zagapito, she's here in London, and she's also one of the world leaders in combining deep learning with computer vision and computer graphics, specifically for, for digital humans, which is um, which is kind of like what we're focused on very much right now as a company. And then there are the Danish co-founder, Stefan, who is a bit more on the, on the business side of things. So, um, yeah. No, this is this is good. So what what is Synthesia today then? Can you give us an overview of the, the, the business? Yeah, sure. So Synthesia today is the world's largest platform for AI video generation. Um, really what we're passionate about is helping people make video content much faster than what was possible before. If you look at the kind of online world today, right, video and audio is now becoming, if it's not already, the default for most of the things that we do, very much so in our personal lives, where I think most people spend more time watching things on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram than they do reading uh, novels or, or paper magazines anymore. We've kind of been accustomed to this video and audio driven uh, form of communication, right? And what we saw was that people also take this preference with them to the workplace. Yet at the workplace, most people are still communicating with slides, PDFs, long emails. It's very, very, very text heavy, right? And that's not because people in big corporations don't want to produce video and audio content, but it's really hard, right? Because you have to deal with cameras, you have to do post-production, the time to create a single, even just a very simple corporate video, a compliance video, for example, that looks simple when you watch it, can easily take weeks or months to produce, right? Versus mm -hmm. making a slide deck or writing, uh, writing, uh, writing a piece of text in an article. So the kind of gap between those two things how it's how kind of time consuming and expensive is it to create a slide deck or a PDF document versus a video was very interesting to us. And uh, that's the kind of problem we're solving today, where we essentially allow people to create video content as easily as you would create a PowerPoint slide, for example. And this is great. I, I guess not everyone's comfortable in front of us, of in front of a camera either. So it gives more people access to to turning their content into videos. Exactly. So exactly. So how does it work? How does video generation work in practice? So the way it works is very simply that you go to Synthesia and uh, you can sign up. You can try out a free video first if you want. Or you can pay $30 to get access to the full platform. And once you have access to the platform, you have two choices. You can either create videos with our stock actors. So these are real actors um, that essentially work with us. And they are paid every time someone generates a video with them. We have a very wide variety of actors of different ages, ethnicities, and so on. And that's probably roughly about half of our customers that use the kind of stock avatars. So as you noted before, some people are not comfortable in camera. They don't want to be the face of, of the videos that they're creating, right? Then the other half of the users are creating their own avatars. So this is just like you have done. You submit a four to five minute video recording. Um, and we then create an AI avatar of yourself. And then you can make videos with the with yourself, essentially. 
Once you've selected your avatar, you then go into the video creation screen. And this is a super simple interface. The way it works is that you have your avatar on the screen. You have a text box. And then you simply type out um, the video that you want to create. You can type in 65 different languages. So it's multilingual per default. And you can also use our video editing capabilities to add in screen recordings, text, animations, background images, videos, bullet points, all of those things that kind of makes a video, right? It's, it's obviously most of the time a video is more than just a person talking to the screen. And then once you're happy with your video, you can preview it. You click generate video. It takes roughly two to three minutes. And then you have a video file, which is a video file like anything else. You can upload it to YouTube. You can use our embeddable video player uh, on your website if you want, or you can just download the file and, and do whatever you want with it. So it's a very, very simple process mm -hmm. to create these videos. And that's one of the kind of uh, key mantras at Synthesia is that this should be something that can be used by everyone, not just people who have uh, experience in video production before. So how, how is synthetic media relevant then today and what makes it different from traditional video? So as I mentioned earlier, really what we're seeing is just that we're moving more and more away from text as the primary mode of communication, right? Even if you take uh, today versus just five years ago, there's so much more video and audio everywhere on the internet. I usually think of something like TikTok as a quite interesting example of this. If you have the progression of Twitter, which was one of the first social media networks, that's purely text-based, right? Mm -hmm. We went to Facebook. Facebook was also, there was a lot of text and a little bit of images. Then we went to Instagram, which was all about images. Um, not that much text left in the interface. And now we're at TikTok, which is only video. And it's mm -hmm. very interesting if you look at just the, the UI of TikTok. There's actually almost no text in the interface. You just scroll through the next video. Uh, you, of course, still have a comment section and things like that. But the UI, the UX is, is all about the video, right? It's not like you're playing a video to watch a video. You kind of, per default, you're watching something that is a video. And I think that's the kind of big shift we're seeing in the online media landscape. And it's also where we're seeing this kind of gap arise, right? Where corporations and businesses, everybody wants to make more video content. Video content converts better. It engages more. It has a higher um, level of information retention if you're doing educational or learning content, for example. But it's so difficult to produce, right? And that's where synthetic content comes in really, really handy. Because with synthetic content, you're not constrained to having to use cameras and microphones and have a nice light setup and all those things that otherwise goes into producing a video. Um, I'm sure you've also tried when you had to record a video that you need to do the script 25 times because maybe you hadn't really practiced it enough or you're working with someone or filming someone who's not an actor kind of by trade. There's so much complexity in making even a very simple video, right? And so Dedic Media comes in and fills that gap. Now that said, I think it's I think it's quite important to think of synthetic video not as a replacement for video production. That's actually not how we're seeing it being used and our customers are using it today. I don't think that will be the, that's not the end goal of synthetic video to replace video production. What we're seeing is that our clients are still creating normal content filled with a camera as much as they did before. And they're also accelerating that, right? Because normal content has a different quality to it that is also great and that we should definitely keep, right? But what we are seeing is that our customers are taking all of their text-driven assets like slide decks, PDFs, help center articles, all of these um, type content pieces where you would never create a video for it if you had to film it, but now you actually can, right? So I think that's a quite important distinction um, as a company is like figuring out where do you apply synthetic content? Where does it really make sense? And where does it not make sense, right? I, you should, probably shouldn't build your next Super Bowl ad with a synthetic video uh, product yet, for example. No, and then this is exactly why I'm excited about it. I, I what what I do is I write lots of articles every week, but I only turn maybe five, ten percent of them into a video. And as you say, it takes time. I then need to book time in the studio. I need to record this, and then, and then have post production. It takes a bit of time. Whereas with Synthesia, I can now create hundred percent of my content into videos, uh, even yeah. the ones I previously haven't. And and even though the the avatars are maybe not quite there yet, the voice is not quite there yet, but I can see the the potential of all of this. So, yeah. if, where where do you think? I mean, this 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 is already amazing technology today. Where where do you think we will be in, let's say, two, five, ten years time? So as a company, 
what really excites us in Thesia and the kind of North Star, right, is that in, in 10, 15 years, you can make a Hollywood gray video on your laptop without the need for anything else than your imagination. We're obviously still quite far from that, right? Like um, the, the point we're at today, the technology is amazing, it has tons of use cases, but we're far from, from making a Hollywood movie yet, right? We see this being something that kind of will, will move in stages. There's a lot of very deep R&D that underpins the, the whole Synthesia product and these technologies in general, we are still very early, right? Mm. Right now, the focus is very much on what I think of as business presentations, and it will be for the next couple of years. It'll be about making training, educational content, uh, sales content, um, all this type of content that usually lives within, within, within companies. And um, mm. we definitely think there's a big opportunity there. Once we're done with that, we'll probably move a bit more into uh, like advertisement, what we think of as external facing content. Um, or kind of very high quality content where you also need the, the avatars to be able to gesticulate a bit more, have a bit more emotions and, and all those things that you still really can't do with, with AI video. Um, so, so that's kind of how we think about it. This kind of North Star of making a Hollywood film, I think to a lot of people might sound a little bit crazy um, and it maybe is a little bit crazy, but it is definitely going to be possible. Like I have zero doubts about that. Um, the timeline, you can question, it's going to be 10 or 15 years, but it will be possible, right? And I think if you look at other forms of media production, uh, like I moonlight as a as a as a hobbyist music producer, and when I open my MacBook, uh, and I open Ableton Live or Logic or some other music production software, I can synthesize every instrument and every audio effect and every amplifier that's ever been in existence. Right? You can actually, you can synthesize an entire orchestra if you want to, um, and that feels not so weird today. That's probably not news to most of the people who are listening in here now. If you go back 50 years in time, right, this was completely unthinkable that you mm -hmm. didn't technically need physical instruments. Um, and I think we're going to see the same thing happening here. And I also think that there's a very interesting, um, uh, there's very interesting kind of idea in this analogy, right? Which is that synthetic content is not going to replace real content, right? It, it's going to be its own genre. It's going to be its own media format. I think it's going to be very obvious to everyone when you're watching synthetic content. Um, it's not going to be replacing it. And I think that's the same thing with music production software, right? Even though we can synthesize a piano or guitar probably to the degree where or more or less everyone in the world wouldn't be able to tell the difference. People still play guitar and piano and play real drums, right? Because it has a certain quality to it that, that we like and that will, that will keep alive. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely believe that in, in 10, 15 years time, I might have an avatar that no one can distinguish from the real me presenting and, yeah. and and you can then use AI to create effects and amazing movies uh, with all of this. And, and I guess we can't talk about deep fakes and synthetic videos without talking about some of the dangers around this. So do you have any concerns? What, what dangers do you see with, with synthetic media? Yeah, for sure. I think it, it's a powerful technology. And I think everyone who has heard about deep fakes has probably heard about it mostly from from kind of like the dangers of it. And they are definitely very, very real, right? Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of perspectives on this and it's a, obviously a discussion that can go kind of, you know, very, very deep. For us, ethics has been, you know, part of the foundation of Synthesia from day one. We kind of set up with an ethical uh, framework uh, mm -hmm. when we started the company. And I think a lot of those things are, are fairly obvious, right? Like we don't synthesize anyone without their consent. Uh, we employ very strict content moderation what we could build on the Synthesia platform. Um, and you obviously can't create avatars of anyone who is not you, right? That, that's, that's I think, fairly self-explanatory. Um, I think there's a bigger conversation about what do we do with this technology is going to be developed. It's also going to be developed in the wild. We obviously can't control who builds it or who gets access to it. So what can we do to alleviate that? There's a technological solution that there's a lot of work being done on. We're also involved in a bunch of initiatives here. Things like deep fake detection, for example, which is the idea that you have an AI that detects if something was made with an AI. There is what's called content provenance, which is, you can think of this kind of like every time you take a photo with your phone or you create a synthetic video, there's a record of that video or photograph being stored in an online database somewhere. So if I'm playing something, if I'm uploading that video to YouTube, you'll be able to see this video was originally created by Victor on this date, um, and it was generated using this particular software. So we get this sort of record of how all content was created and where it came from originally. I think that solution from a technical perspective is the most interesting because it doesn't just solve for deep fakes, which is right now a very minor part in the whole disinformation, misinformation problem, right? And um, that will also solve for people, you know, 
taking a video of an explosion that happened in Iraq five years ago, posting that on, on TikTok and saying this happened yesterday in, in Syria, for example, right? That's still the biggest problem we have with misinformation. So having this kind of record driven system would be great. We have it for music already. YouTube does a very good job of, if I record myself dancing to a Michael Jackson song, YouTube will detect that. This is a piece of music that has been copyrighted by someone else. They will put an ad in it and they will pay uh, the Michael Jackson uh, rights holders. Um, they have a system of where does this music come from? Who owns it? How much should they be paid, right? But I actually think the most important part of, 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 um, of uh, reducing harm of deep fake technologies is education. Um, it's about informing people that this is now possible. It, it feels, I think, to people like this is, you know, uh, new and different. Nothing like this has happened in history before. But the reality is that, well, that's to be determined, right? But I think we've seen a lot of media technologies emerge throughout history before. And it's the same fears we see every time a new one comes out. So preparing people. For, for, for what's now possible is really important. You've been able to forge images and emails for the last 20 or 30 years relatively easy. You can forge a tweet or edit a tweet very, very easily if you have just very basic technical skills. It's not like forgery of content is a new idea, right? It's now possible with video, so we need to inform people about that. And I think one of the ways to do that is, of course, like we're doing here, we're talking about it, we're showing people what it looks like. Uh, but I think actually the most effective part of it, and I think the way that most people learn about these technologies is through the positive use cases. There is, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of videos on TikTok now made with avatars, very clearly marked as being made with avatars. There is all our customers who are training their employees are working with their stakeholders or customers, knowing they're watching synthetic videos. We did the Lionel Messi campaign, the Beckham campaign. These things is how we expose people to synthetic media in a way where, you know, you know that's not real, right? And the more times you've seen a video that looks pretty real, but you know it's not real, then you kind of start to build that inherent understanding that you should be cautious if you see something in the video. Completely agree. So you, you talked about positive use cases. So what applications of synthetic media do you see across the businesses, across enterprises? Yeah. So we see a lot of very different use cases, but I think a few ones that stand out to me is education and training is huge with synthetic content right now. So you can take the example of um, uh, a customer facing FAQ help center, for example. That's a pretty common use case, right? So you're a big company, you have a product, and your customers probably have a lot of questions about that product. So you have an FAQ or help desk center somewhere on your website. Now, traditionally, this has been mostly text, sometimes with some images. Um, depending on the product, of course, this is not always the best way of communicating with your customers. It's much easier to understand something if there's a video that you're watching and you have to read something. This goes very much for complex products like insurance or financial products, for example. If you ask people to read a very long wall of text that will kind of almost per definition exclude a certain part of the population who, who doesn't want to read that much and maybe can't comprehend all these words. If you show them a video instead, with some visuals, it's a nice explanations. Maybe they can watch it in their own language. That is that the information retention and the learning rate just goes up so much, right? It also goes for internal trainings, of course. So if you take one of the world's biggest fast food companies, they are training hundreds of thousands of people every single month on everything from how do we react to COVID in the particular location that you're in to how do you empty the oil in a deep fryer to just general standard operating procedures. If you train people with text and you say, here's 15 pages of PDF documents, please read these uh, before next week. Most people will read them, but they won't remember much of what is in those documents, right? If you show them a video instead, um, again, you remember, I think it's roughly 80% of what you watch in a video versus 8% of what you read. So you can train your staff much more efficiently and much faster than you're doing it with text. And the key thing here is, of course, that the videos you're creating are as easy to create as the slide deck you were using before, right? So you get a huge um, value add in terms of the information retention um, without having to incur the costs, not just in, in dollars or pounds or whatever you're, you're measuring your cost in, but also very much in time and coordination cost. Because if you're making a video, then you probably have someone who is writing the script, you have someone who is filming it, you have someone who is the actor, you have someone who's doing the post-production. These are all different people. They need to coordinate. 
if you all of a sudden record something and you're like, oh, a month after, actually, this has changed now. This is no longer relevant. You can't really do much. You have to go back into the studio to record it. With, with, with synthetic content, right, it is, again, it's as easy as making a slide deck. So it's one person who can sit down and create the content. It's one person who can go back and edit it if something changes. And that is just, that is really kind of the game changer. Then we also have a bunch of use cases that I think is worth mentioning. Um, I think right now we're very much in the state of this technology where we kind of apply it to use cases that uh, that kind of are pre-existing, like making videos for compliance and training is not a new fundamental concept, right? People have been doing that for a very long time. It's just much faster and much more efficient and much more affordable than it was before. But the really interesting thing to me about synthetic content is that because it's a purely digital workflow, as opposed to a physical process with cameras and microphones, you can do anything with it, right? It's just code. So when the first websites came out, you know, way back in the day, they basically looked like copies of paper magazines, right? Because that was our imagination. It was like, oh, here's a computer, here's a screen. I can try and copy my paper magazine uh, onto this, and then we have something that works. Obviously, since then, websites are interactive. They are dynamic. They are personalized. They have video on them. It's a completely different media than opening up a paper magazine, right? And we'll see the same thing with, with synthetic content, I'm pretty sure. We're already seeing a bit today with personalization where you can go in and, you know, at maybe a bit more the gimmick level, the video can say, hey, Bernard, welcome to today's training. At the more interesting level, you can say, if you're a company training your staff, for example, um, this is Bernard. Bernard, he uh, speaks German really well. He would prefer to take his trainings in German over English. He has this particular role and his technical uh, skill level is five out of five, for example. Then we can use that information to say, okay, then when we explain technical concepts, maybe let's not bore Bernard with five minutes about how to open a Zoom call. You probably understand that already, right? And also we know what role you have in the company. So if it's compliance, for example, you work in sales, maybe there's some detail that is different from the sales team that we can then put in versus if you work um, in customer support, for example. And so we, we start to get to this point where experiences can be personalized and interactive and dynamic. And this sounds maybe a bit sci-fi or, or, or futuristic, but actually that's how most of the internet works, right? When you go to a learning platform at a big company, they have these data points. They tailor all the content to be specifically to you, but they do it with text because text is very easy to work with, right? And we're now bringing those capabilities to video as well. So I think we're like right now in this phase of people mostly creating linear content, video as we understand it today. But the next phase of this will be, I think, a new type of media format that emerges. And I think it's it's hard to guess what that's going to look like in three or four years. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be very different from normal video. And I'm pretty sure that it's also going to be, if we go back to the deep fakes discussion about education, I think most of the content that's synthetic we're going to uh, consume in three or four years, it's going to be completely obvious to everyone that it's synthetic. Because when you turn on your, uh, your news channel, um, and the news anchor is saying your name. They know what stocks you own. They know what football team you like. That's clearly not real, right? And that is kind of like what I think the future is going to look like. So I think that's an interesting thing here also where um, it, it, it's just going to be, I think it's going to be very obvious when you're watching synthetic content because it's going to be utilizing the fact that it's synthetic. Yeah, and it gives us amazing opportunities, as you say, for personalization and making things that we can't do today. Um, you... You mentioned that um, since synthetic video is not going to replace traditional videos, it's not going to replace uh, humans or AI avatars won't replace humans. But I, I think I'd like to challenge you on this, or I'd like to exp you to expand on this a bit more because I I see parallels in the fashion industry, for example. We now have the ability to create synthetic uh, models, for example, to showcase. Uh, our fashion which is great and so much more convenient so much better in many ways uh, we have don't have the same production cost similarly to what we're talking about here so i i think more and more um fashion companies will move to using synthetic models for example and i then question where where, where will this leave traditional models in the same way where will this leave traditional um, video, for example, in let's go forward 10, 15 years time when my avatar looks completely like me and sounds exactly like me. Why would I then want 
to spend some time in the, in a video studio filming videos. So what's your take on that? Yeah, it's a very good point. And I think you're very right. Like it's, it's definitely going to have a big impact on the video audio image industry for sure. Right. And the way I think about this is that really what these tools can do is they can automate a big part of the kind of production process. Mm. Right. Um, it's about if it's a fashion shoot, it's 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 kind of like the same thing, right? You have to you have to get into a big studio, you have to get some models in, you're probably restrained to like how many models can you shoot in a day? Um, how diverse can you make a model shoot in just one day? That there's all these production and kind of mm. operational questions that that are just hard to solve, right? And I definitely do think that in those cases, so that content will be the winner. So I think if you're doing something that is very kind of technical processy, that is one of the things which we've seen in history, right? Is it, it, it's probably not going to be um, as big of an industry as it is today. If you were a blacksmith before the cars came out and you did horseshoes, that was probably a great business. But once the cars came out, that's it's 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 kind of a it's a very different business at least, right? In very particular in terms of like the the model industry, I think I think what we'll see is that if your kind of primary um, thing is that you have a pretty face is uh, I think that's going to be less valuable in the future because those can be generated, right? But I think what will really matter a lot, right, is who is good storytellers, who have, who knows how to break down a subject and make it understandable to the average person on the street, which is something you're great at, for example, right? And um, it's going to be more about the production process changing than the creative aspect of it. I was actually talking about someone uh, with, with this, with influencers, someone was saying, there will be no influencers in the future because they'll all be AI generated. And I think that if we take this particular example, I think it's actually very, very interesting because maybe it will not be as big of an asset if you want to be an influencer, how you look. You could create a, a character, right? That could be the influencer for you. Mm -hmm. And you could focus on the storytelling, if you're really funny, whatever you to do. It's all about that. It's not so much about having the right genetics and fitting into the box of whatever we think an influencer needs to look like in 2022, right? So I think it, all these technologies really like levels the playing field. It's more about kind of inherent skill and creativity than it's about winning the kind of uh, genetic uh, lottery to some extent. And I still think we'll have lots of influencers that are real. We have some that are unreal. Um, but I don't think I don't think we will just like in the music industry, like we're still playing drums and piano and and um, and and strings and all these uh, instruments, right? It's just it's just a different type of media. Yeah, and I think it's a very very good response and. And for me, whenever I talk about the impact of AI and machine learning on the job market, for me, what it actually enables us to do is to move up the value chain, move up to something that humans are amazing at. And if you think about this, me spending a time um, in front of a camera in a studio filming myself <laughs> is maybe not the best use of my time. And, and exactly. maybe it would be better for me to create really cool videos that people want to watch on TikTok nowadays that we can't yet create with, with synth synthetic avatars that are more real, more immersive. I, 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 no, I, for me, it's just exactly. going up. It, it's, you're so right. It's, it's, it's all about like where you actually valuing, uh, adding value as Bernard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like you're not adding value by going over and setting up a camera and uh, recording it and making sure that everything like that's, that's not, that's not, not why you're great at what you do. Mm. That's not the core skill. And I think, I totally agree with you. I think, you know, once these technologies are out, maybe all of a sudden, or like that's already happening, is that learning instructors and business analysts and consultants, they become video producers, right? Mm. That's already what we're seeing in a lot of, with our clients today. It's, it's actually not the video production department that's using these technologies that much. It's all the other people in the company who now have the superpowers to make video, right? Um, and I think this this just goes for everything. It's I think we're all going to be more kind of creative directors um, as opposed to being the artist sitting, you know, with the with the paintbrush and, and doing every little thing pixel because that that part of the, the value chain is just going to have less value as we as we move into the, the age of AI. Absolutely. Um, we touched on this a little bit. But what's the process if anyone wanted to create a custom avatar for themselves? Yeah, so it's it's actually pretty simple. Um, it's four to five minutes of uh, a video that we need. There's some instructions, of course, that you need to follow. It's easy. We give you a script. 
may ask you to do a, a few specific things for the AI to really kind of learn and understand how you how you look when you when you talk. Um, you could do it in with a webcam. You could do it in a professional studio. The key thing here is that the input is the output. So if you sent me, uh, like if I recorded myself as I'm standing here right now, that's what my avatar would look like. Mm. And if I went into a studio with really nice lighting, perfect green screen, makeup, nice uh, suit on and all these things, that's what my avatar would look like. Um, and I think actually what we're seeing interestingly enough is that not everyone wants a studio avatar. If you're doing something that's more custom success or salesy, actually it's not too bad if it looks like you're kind of on your webcam. Uh, it kind of gives a different vibe to the, mm. to the to the avatar, right? That's also something that's quite interesting. Um, we're soon launching like a very kind of efficient way to do this, which is completely self-service. Um, I, we haven't said that publicly yet, but uh, that, that's coming quite soon. And that will enable anyone to, to do this really easily at home from, from the web, with just the webcam huh. if, they, if they just want to try it out. Very cool. Yeah, I, I went through this process and I went to, into the, the studio. Um, the other part of this is obviously the voice. So I can give my avatar any voice. I can make it speak any language. But if I wanted to have a custom voice, what's the process of creating that? So custom voices generally require something between 15 minutes to half an hour of audio content. Usually the more, the better. We integrate with a company called Descript, who offer really good um, AI cloned voices. Um, and there's a bunch of other providers you can use as well, but Descript and uh, also a company called Lovo, you can actually integrate directly on the Synthesia platform. I know you have done that, where you created the device there, and then you're just using it with your avatar inside of uh, Synthesia. Very good. You, you talked about the, the self-service coming up as a, as a feature. Any other exciting features that are on the horizon? Yeah, so, so this this year for us is is first about releasing the next generation of our AI avatars. So you've you've tried them out and they're pretty amazing, I would say. Um, I can say that because I'm not the, the technical genius behind it, but there's still some kinks to be ironed out. Sometimes they have a little bit of funny whip, uh, head movements. Sometimes they do the lip sync isn't perfect. There's still like some some things you need to iron out, and we're getting pretty close to releasing the next iteration of the avatars which will give the users an element of control over the avatars. Um, essentially, as you probably would expect, you know, in, in a couple of years down the line, if you want to make more exciting and storytelling type of content, you want to think about stuff like emotions. How are you saying something? Are you saying it in a salesy way? Are you selling it in a, in a very friendly way? And those capabilities is something that's going to be inside of uh, Synthesia in sometime between the next three to six months, most likely. Outside of that, we're also building our entire platform outside of the AI part to just be a really good tool for making your video. Because what we realized is that one thing is having an avatar video of yourself. But if you look at most videos online, they'll have some text, they'll have some images, they'll maybe have a screen recording if you're doing training and education. And all those capabilities we're actually bringing onto the platform so that you can do your video creation end to end inside of uh, Synthesia. And that's something where we're quite excited about because this just again, makes it accessible to everyone. You don't need to first generate your video in Synthesia and then take it out and work at it in Adobe Premiere or whatever your, your favorite video editing software is. Yeah, this sounds super exciting. So w what sort of clients are you currently working with and how are they using your, your platform? So we work with everyone from... I mean, I spoke to last week, I spoke to, to a local barbershop from Brazil who's making videos for his Facebook page, uh, all the way to the biggest companies in the world. Ernest & Young, for example, is one of our big clients. They have, I think, something like 30 or 35 of their partners that have their own AI avatar, which they use to communicate both internally, of course, but also like in their sales process and so on. Um, so we have a very wide range of clients. Um, we do work a lot with the Fortune 1000 companies where there's just a huge need for scaling communication. Mm. Um, so it's a, that, but the, the, the good thing about our platform is that it is really self-service. You can get started for $30. So no matter if you're, uh, if you're a small, small business owner of your EY, um, you can go in and, and just start using Synthesia. For me personally, it's really, really important that these technologies are democratizing, right? That they enable people to, do more things than they could before. And there's definitely a huge part of our team who is just super excited about giving small business owners the capabilities to also better compete with companies that have much more resource uh, mm -hmm. than they do, right? And I think one of those where you can equalize that is 
if you can make video content really easily and really scalable, you can have a huge leg up in terms of your marketing and training mm -hmm. and education efforts, right? Um, and you can kind of, again, get rid of those barriers and make it all about, hey, who's actually doing the best product? Mm -hmm. Who's telling the best story, right? Less about all the kind of outside stuff um, ar ar around a company or around a Hollywood film, for example, that ha doesn't have anything to do with the creative quality of that product or that story, but it's much more to do with different kinds of gatekeeping and, and politics. Amazing. Looking ahead then a little bit, what are your hopes and predictions for the future in this whole space? So I think we're very early in the synthetic media space. Um, and I think the next five years is going to be really, really exciting. So one of the things I'm really looking forward to is, is, is getting the first sneak peeks of what does synthetic content look like? What is this new media format, right? where video is not just a video that you play from beginning until the end and everybody watches the same video. What is it going to look like when newscasts or training videos or sales videos are truly interactive and personalized? That's going to be really exciting, uh, especially because I'm, 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 I'm using a few examples here, but I don't think I, I, I can't predict that, right? Like who would have predicted that watching other people play computer games would be a $10 billion use case for streaming over uh, a browser, right? That was, that was totally not obvious. So that's something I'm very excited about seeing how that kind of pans out. Mm. The other thing I'm very excited about is working as an industry to um, really figure out kind of like, how do we maximize the potential of these technologies while reducing the harm? I think there are lots of great initiatives uh, that we're involved in. I'm particularly excited about the content authenticity initiative by Adobe, which is about this building these kind of media problems and media records for every single piece of media content that exists out there on, on the internet. Um, because I think having kind of a safety first view of these technologies is going to be super important, right? Fascinating. Thank you so much, Victor. This was a, an amazing conversation and I'm so excited to use this technology and see where synthetic video is going in the future. So thank you so much. Thanks for that. It's a pleasure.